Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for being here. I've, uh, I've been looking forward to this day for a while, so I'm really glad to be where I am right now. If you're new here, my name is Pete Candler. I'm a writer, photographer based in Asheville, North Carolina, and I write about the practice of memory and forgetfulness in the American South at a deepersouth.com. The vision of a deeper South is rooted in the idea that the spiritual, political, and cultural health of a nation, region, city, town, or person depends upon an honest and unflinching memory. That the gravest danger to our cities and ourselves is a willful amnesia. That hope is to be found through the work of active remembrance, putting back together the fragments of personhood scattered by a culture of selective memory. I'm really honored today to have my guest, the former Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, former Mayor of New Orleans and founder of the E Pluribus Unum Fund and author of In the Shadow of Statues, A White Southerner Confronts His History, Mitch Landrieu. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really uh, honored that you made time in your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I wanted to say a word about your book because, uh, I mean, I have a lot of words I'd like to say about your book, which is really a tremendous piece of work. And even though the, the cover and the title suggest it's um, about your role in, ha in having these con Confederate and uh, re anti-Reconstruction monument removed in New Orleans is really a memoir about your life as a whole. And it puts the, uh, the, the removal of those four monuments in the context of a whole life that uh, I found really powerful and really uh, fascinating. I wanted to read one line from your uh, from your book in the shadow of statues and see if you could unpack this one for us a little bit. I quote, once you've been Jesus, it's all downhill. <laughs> oh my God. All right. So th first of all, thank everybody for, uh, for, for having me on. I'm, I'm really honored to be in your presence and, this is a this is obviously a powerful subject that's important for us, not only personally in, in our communities, but for the country as well. That was an allusion to the fact that when I was a uh, junior in high school, I played Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar. And you know, once you, when you're in high school, if you're the lead of a play, much less playing, you know, our Savior. I mean, everything else is downhill from there. I haven't really approximated, you know, how I felt after. You know, we took a bow and we got a standing ovation. <laughs> it's just like every, everything else has paled in comparison. And it was a, uh, it, it was just a statement. For those of you that, that don't know this about me, I, my first love in the world is um, acting and singing and dancing. I wanted to be a professional actor. That's what I wanted to be. Uh, after I bugged my parents to be a police officer, an astronaut, you know, a race car driver, everything else in the world. When I was in... Uh, in the grammar school that I went to, they had a nun who uh, was a singing coach. And we used to have these singing contests. And I can remember singing, leaving on a jet plane in second grade and, you know, entertainment hour at the end. And all the way through, I figured out that by the time I got to eighth grade, somehow my parents took me to go see, which is really strange because they had nine kids in our family. So the fact that I ended up in the movie with my parents was just weird. Uh, all of a twist. And when I saw that, I thought, you know what, that's what I want to do with my life. I went to Jesuit High School, uh, which is an all boys Catholic school here. And they happened to just fortuitously have a great theater department with a, a guy uh, whose name was Sonny Bory. They just assumed could have been producing shows on Broadway. And we were renowned in the area that we are from for doing shows. And from the time I was a, in eighth grade until the time I finished, I did plays every year and actually took singing lessons and dancing lessons. Became a professional actor when I was 16 years old, got my equity card. Um, performing in a professional theater down the street from my house. And my dream was to go to Broadway. And so when I went to college, I went to the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., precisely because they had a great theater department. 
and they had a great political science department and I was a fairly good tennis player and they had a bad out they had a bad enough tennis team for me to make so it was it all kind of worked out that way um during college I traveled around the world I did a USO tour with a group of people entertaining the troops uh in um Germany Scotland England and Wales I uh, I spent about a week in New York, you know, standing in line with 600 people who were much better looking and smarter and better dancers and singers than me. Um, and my father eventually said to me, you know, son, you ought to have something to fall back on. So why don't you come home and go to law school? Which I did. Met my, the woman who was going to be my wife in law school and uh, wound up, you know, getting stuck running for the legislature, practicing law. And then, you know, I got stuck with being the mayor and the lieutenant governor. I never did get to Broadway. Still hoping to get there there's, one day. There's still time. <laughs> I think there is. <laughs> I think there is. Anyway, that's that. That's the that's the long story of it. But arts and music have been a very important part of my life and my formation. Um, you know, kids ask me all the time what impact that's had on on my ability to do my work as a public servant. And you know, a lot of what we do is performance art. In other words, you know, being able to articulate a message, being able to give a speech, being able to uh, kind of communicate with the public. The difference is that, you know, in the business that we're in, you're basically writing the script, producing it, and, you know, performing it. Um, it helped with a lot of other people, but it was very helpful to me on, to on top of a much, much deeper insight, which is that the truth in the world, the truth, if you're looking for the truth, you will generally find it on the lips of the poets and the songwriters. And you'll find the truth in the beauty of a piece of art or an orchestral piece or a jazz ensemble. All of those things are mediums for being reflective of human um, capacity at a particular moment in time. And those truths, if you think about it, transcend time and they transcend place. And my mind immediately goes uh, to John Donne, who wrote a poem a long, long time ago. Uh, and he's, you, you may know the poem, but essentially it talks, it's about death. And he says, don't, do not ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Um, where he talks about the, the, the intersectionality and the, the fact that each of us um, depends on the other. And of course, this same idea was enunciated by Robert Kennedy in his Ripples of Hope speech. And of course, you see it in the ethos throughout our entire history about that ends up in a political moment of today, which is we're a whole lot better together than we are apart. And one things that we do and things that we do not do affect us all. So we ought to quit trying to, we ought to stop trying to live in this myth that we're somehow independent, isolated beings um, whose actions or inactions don't mean anything. It reminds me of a, of a line from Wendell Berry's Jefferson lecture a few years ago, which he concluded with, uh, the line, we do not have to live as if we are alone. <laughs> well, you, yeah. What, I, what I've also noticed is that I haven't had an original thought in my <laughs> whole life. Is that somewhere, somewhere, somehow, somebody thought about what I was doing a long time ago. It might have actually been tucked away, you know, which goes to the history of what we remember and what we don't remember. Who got to write the story? Who didn't get to write the story? The whole story has not been told. And, you know, based on your introduction, it is absolutely true that what we have forgotten, either intentionally or by benign, benign neglect or malignant intent, what we have chosen not to uh, memorialize are equally important and tells us as much about who we have chosen to remember and who we have chosen to emulate, what stories we have chosen to tell. And I know that, you know, we share the common, the common feeling uh, that uh, we have lost something tremendous in this country and especially in the South by being so exclusive, so exclusionary, not inviting, um, and how much better we actually could be if everybody was invited to the party um, and was given equal opportunity and equal responsibility. I want to come back to um, what you just said about the arts and about truth and poetry and song and so forth and um, it's easy to see why, you know, you, you, as a lifelong resident of New Orleans, if that's so important to you. There's not a more musical, culturally rich city in America, maybe. 
So I want to come back to that in a minute, but when you were talking about the, um, what we choose to remember, what we choose to leave out. A lot of my work driving around the Southeast kind of with very little direction has depended on the old WPA guides, which I'm sure you know. And I have a reproduction of the, the New Orleans guide, which, you know, is a, these are great resources, but they're also because there are a lot of things recorded in the WPA guides that are, are now lost to us. But they also communicate a kind of perspective and they communicate in some subtle ways, this sort of amnesia. And so I want to read you one little section from, this is Motor Tour One, describing Liberty Monument. A simple granite shaft standing in the center of the neutral ground and commemorating the declaration that the citizens of right ought to be and meant to be free of the obnoxious carpet bag rule. It was here on September 14, 1874, that shots were fired by citizens of the city, challenging further invasion of their right to rule themselves. It's got a little bit more detail. But this is a curious description for what it doesn't say. And one of those is, um, I have this very poorly laser jet printed photograph taken by Dorothea Lang of the base of this monument. And it reads, United States troops took over the state government and reinstated the usurpers, but the national election, November 1876, recognized white supremacy in the South and gave us our state. There you go. That's not mentioned in the WPA guide, even though it was written after that was inscribed on the, pedis, the pediment in 1932. This is one of the monument, one of the four monuments that you were instrumental in having removed from New Orleans. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people know that story, but this one seemed like it was of the four, the most overtly white supremacist monument. Is that, do you think that's, I mean, it says, it's a, basically a monument to the reestablishment of white supremacy. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, there's, so, there's so much stuff packed into your question. First yeah. of all, the, the, w, the, the uh, Works Products Administration and the allocation of funds to stand up artists um, and millions of other Americans that were not working is actually a model that the country hopefully we'll go back to as we try to stand the economy up from COVID. I'm hoping that, you know, we do that again. It was a, it actually was really wonderful. There are people that are not working right now in New Orleans. Um, and this is, this is true throughout the country, but a lot in the South, we have artists and musicians that help us be who we are, who are now out of work, who don't have tools, who don't have appliances, who don't have audiences. Um, and they are going to atrophy and go away unless we stand them up. And it's a wonderful way to put people back to work. And I'm hoping that, number one, I'm hoping that, that we have a new president sooner rather than later. And I'll take it before January 20th if I can get it. But um, as we think about helping Americans get through this time that we're in, that was a great model, number one. Number two, but how you fill up that model and what you write about and how you remember things is the second part of your question that's critically important. And then the third part is in the scope of the monuments that we took down and there were four, what's the relationship between them? Um, ironically, um, when I was thinking through which, if any monuments to take down, um, there were pressures obviously from both sides or all, I should say all sides because there were many, there weren't just two views of this. Um, and of course I wasn't, I didn't start this on my own. There had been a push to take down these monuments since the day that they were put up. Mm -hmm. And everybody should know that they weren't put up right after the Civil War. They started getting put up in 1890. And there were actually some, many that were put up in, after 1950. And these monuments ostensibly uh, and overtly were designed to commemorate and to adulate, to lift up, to honor 
That was the point of it and to send a message. It was actually a propaganda campaign by the Daughters of the Confederacy with the intent purpose of communicating a very clear message to the rest of America. And I'm not making this up. This is not my judgment. It's actually written. They wrote it. So the vice president of the Confederacy gave something called the cornerstone speech. You can go look at it. You can read it. And essentially, it's a pay on to white supremacy. They, they overtly say white people are smarter than black people. We're better than them. And even though we lost the war, what was lost was a great cause. In other words, the world should have should be on the side of the losers because, you know, the northern aggressors didn't understand what humanity was about. And we in the in the Confederacy, not to be to be distinguished, I'm sorry, from the South. Not everybody in the South was for the Confederacy. But ostensibly they were put up to send a message to African Americans that even though the war was lost, that the power structure in the South uh, was actually going to rule the day. So after after the war, you know, Reconstruction happened. Um, actually, the very thing that you would expect to happen happened where there was freedom. People got educated, people got learned, people, uh, uh, African Americans particularly, held high office until the federal troops left. And then the lynching started, and then the oppression started, and you all know the history better than I do. But during that period of time, those monuments were put up to send a message that this is who we revere, this is who we remember, this is who we hold up. And oh, by the way, if you're not part of this, you're less than, and we're going to do everything we can not just by putting these monuments up, by passing rules and our regulations, putting barriers in your way to stop African Americans from enjoying what the Constitution had, uh, the rights that were bestowed by the Constitution. That's what they were. Um, the Liberty Monument was a little bit interesting because it wasn't technically a Confederate monument. It was actually a monument that was adulation to the Klan for helping win a battle on the streets of New Orleans where police officers were killed. Now, so think about it in the moment that we're in with, with some people who are saying, I'm conservative, I believe in the police. When it came to choosing between race and police, they chose race. That's, ex that's essentially what happened. I, uh, I'm not a historian. I'm sure there's a lot of context around that. But essentially, uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, a police force that at the time and other folks that was integrated, that was fighting, they lost. They lost to the political, uh, to the racist power structure. Uh, basically run by the Klan, and a number of officers were killed, that statue was put up to honor the people who did the killing. So as we jump forward into 2014 to 16 and a half or 17, when we were in this midst, um, that was the, the one monument that nobody even tried to defend. As, as much as they tried to defend the Confederate monuments, there was no way and I don't think it's because they, they, I don't think it's because they didn't believe in it. I thought they, I thought they knew that it was not defensible. Mm -hmm. And so strategically they were like, well, we don't want to fight about that one. You know? So the next thing was on all sides, there, there are a, a number of uh, advocates um, who believe that everything should come down. And when I say everything that that falls into the category of, if you start this, where's it going to stop? Their answer is it's not going to stop anywhere keep going. And now you have the big discussion that we're having in the country, which is a, a legitimate discussion. Well, what about the founding fathers? Uh, what about, you know, um, Jefferson? What about Washington? What about anybody that owns slaves? And you see people on the right wanting to deflect away from the issue of the Confederate stuff by talking about that. They'll do anything they can not to talk about this. And this, this racial deflection that occurs is the same thing that occurs when you start talking about Black Lives Matter. White people who want to live in denial want to talk about everything else except that. And so from my perspective, all of those conversations are very interesting, but it seems to me that there is not much defense. Although people have a right to have what opinion they want about whether we all, <laughs> some people believe that white supremacy is still a good thing. I just happen to think that it's antithetical to being an American. Um, but the, the Confederate monuments, there are about 1,700 of them um, on public land that were put up for the purses of reverence. I just think that in the world that we're in today, um, for people that are thinking correctly about how we're supposed to come together in communion as a country, it's very hard to defend them. Now, right away, um, the people who want them to stay up 
it's funny to watch them twist themselves into pretzels about finding a justification that they think a right thinking person would grab onto. Well, their history and you're going to tear down history. Um, no, actually you can't, history is history, whether the monuments are up or down, how you remember history and how you revere history are two different things. And you can remember something and not revere it. And if you were going to remember it and not revere it, that would kind of guide you to how you're going to remember it. And in the context, they say, well, don't take them down. Let's contextualize them. You said, well, that's really interesting, you know, because People have been trying to get those things down since they put up. How come you didn't offer contextualization before? And by the way, if you're going to contextualize a statute of Robert E. Lee that happens to be 60 feet tall, why do you just want to put a three by three plaque on the bottom that says, oh, he really didn't mean it? Like, what does real contextualization look like? And oh, by the way, um, do we really need 1,700 of them? Um, and if you remember these guys, who, who, did, who didn't you remember? What didn't you remember? Um, why did you not think about right down the street where in New Orleans, for example, more people were sold into slavery than anywhere else in the country? And you, you historians whose job it was to remember our history, you never really helped us think about that. So here's, here's my accusation, that you, you were guilty of historical malfeasance. If your self-appointed job is, for, is to help us remember our history, why have you remembered so little of it? And why just those four years? And if you've, if you've chosen not to tell us about 97% of it, what have you lost for us since you're the self-appointed historians? And of course, they don't have an answer for that. And you know, the, everybody on this call knows the answer to this. Our history, our sordid, our beautiful, our conflicting, our contradictory history is so much richer and so much deeper that gives us such a better foundation to stand on to build a better future than the very narrow one that we have chosen to remember um, because we didn't have the power or whoever the powers had be limited what it is that we were taught. And that is a, that's a, I think a very telling lesson for the country. And I say that because my mother, who I think is a saint, she had nine children in 11 years. She's gone right to heaven. You know, she actually said to me, you know, I, I don't know what those monuments were about. My daddy used to take me to the Mardi Gras parades and that's where I used to stand. So that's all I remember about that space. And after she read my book, she said to me, I'm assuming that because you're my son, what you wrote in that book was true. And I said, yeah. I, said I think it's right. I think it's true. It's accurate. She said, well, you know, they, she almost had a tear in her eye. She said, you know, they never taught us any of that stuff. What she lost in her life because she did not know, or she wasn't made aware of, or she you know, was able to deny because it wasn't something that people wanted to confront, was a great loss, not just for African Americans, but for white people in the South too. And I think that that's something that we should really be leaning into right now in our country. It is amazing to think about. You, you touched earlier on the distinction between the South and the Confederacy, but I think in the popular imagination, those two things are identical with one another. You talk, you know, beautifully you know that, about, go ahead. You, you know that's not true though. Right, yeah. I have, a, I, have a, I have a, for all you Northerners that are listening, I got a real chip on my shoulder because I love the South. I love this, I really do love the South. There's so much that's so spectacular and um, I went to school in, in Washington, D.C., which I consider to be very north. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and, I, and I remember everybody thinking because I'm the South and I talk a little bit funny that maybe I wasn't smart. Maybe we don't know how to read or write or do arithmetic down here. And there's a little bit of that that goes on in this country. You know, oh, I'm glad y'all are talking about race in the South. Can y'all fix that? And y'all you know, come to tell the rest of us pure people around the country when, of course, if you've been to Boston or you've been to Minneapolis or you've been to Portland, Oregon, anywhere that you've been in the country, you know racism is this nation's Achilles heel. Slavery uh, you know, is, was our original sin and it has permeated all of the institutions and every facet of every state in this nation. But we got our, we got our stuff. Um, Lee Circle, actually, the physical space where the Lee Monument stood, which is technically named Tivoli Circle, because that's what, it was, that's what it was when the city was created in 1718 and it wasn't changed until 1890, was actually a space that the Union soldiers slept on. 
not the Confederates. And oh, by the way, Robert E. Lee never even came to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this notion that every Southerner was, was part of the Confederacy, which by the way, and I know I'm going to get you all in trouble. This is not my podcast. It's basically a caliphate. That's basically what the Confederacy was. It was a self-ordained thing that was never formally recognized by anybody and was not even a formal governmental entity. Now think about that for a minute. You know, as we, as we you know, create this myth around uh, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee um, and how you could get to these guys fighting for freedom when in fact what they were doing was fighting to destroy the United States of America to preserve the cause of slavery that narrative takes you in two different directions. If they were freedom fighters and they were fighting to uphold the liberty, then you say, oh yeah, let's go, let's go after that. But if you say, well, wait a minute, <laughs> wait, what's, what are you, who are you fighting again? You know, what's the purpose of it? What are you trying to do? Oh, we're doing it because of the economy. Really, well, how's the economy work? Well, it works on free labor and forced labor camp where people are hung and raped. Oh, I, that doesn't sound so good to me anymore. It doesn't sound like going with the wind. I, I thought that was the story. No, 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 that wasn't the story. You know, the Tulsa riots? Oh, wait, who, I, thought, I thought black people rioted. No, 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 white people went and tore everything down. Really, why? You know, tell me about Emmett Till. You start telling people stories now, and you're waking up their imagination, and now you can't, you can't turn away from it. So once you know that stuff, now that you know, now what? Now that you know, well, where should we go? Now that you know, what should we do? Now that you know, how do we fix the things that are broken? Um, and it's a tough, tough conversation for our country to have that white people are having a really hard time dealing with, understandably, but, but it's necessary and it's time, it's past time. I want to, in a minute, come back to this, uh, you know, the importance of storytelling in your own work now at the Union Fund. Um, and, but I want to circle back for a minute to the Lee Circle, because I think the first time I ever visited New Orleans may have been the second, but I stayed in a hotel overlooking Lee Circle. And at that time, that was 20 something years ago, I wasn't making these kinds of connections. You know, it wasn't at the point where I asked questions like, when was that monument put there? Um, by whom? What does it really mean? He just sort of took them for granted as uh, part of the landscape. But your the the moment where you you describe you had a kind of transformative awareness moment as you describe it in your language when it was an artist who made you think differently about Lee Circle and it was do you think it was a do you think it was friend who happens to be a great one of the great he's all right musicians he's all right <laughs> he's all right um, do you think it's an accident that he, this came to you by way of a friend who also has had, is a virtuosic, virtuosic artist? He's talking about Wynton Marsalis. I say he plays his, his horns. All right. Uh, let me, let me just kind of put this in context for you. So it doesn't sound more dramatic than it actually was. Um, my father, poor white kid from Adam Street, grew, right up, grew, grew up across the street from a cemetery in a house that was, I don't know, 14 feet wide and 60 feet deep, whose mother had a third grade education and whose father worked for public service, gets to Jesuit high school, finds himself at Loyola Law School, does fairly well, and finds himself in the legislature in 1960 when Jimmy Davis, who you could just juxtapose that for, for George Wallace, was preaching segregation forever. My daddy had gotten to be... Uh, best friends with the first African-American to go to Loyola Law School, whose name is Dr. Norman C. Francis, you may know now, but he was Norman when they were kids. And that relationship formed my father's life. And in 1960, when my dad got to the legislature, he was one of two people that voted against segregation. And he had Leander Perez, the great racist of all time from Louisiana, and Willie Rainick pinned him against the wall in a, uh, in a hotel um, elevator and said, we know you're kind, we're gonna get you. Um, my mother was pregnant for me, um, which meant she had four young babies at home that were under five years old. And so you can imagine, you know, that he, I mean, it was, it was 1960. 
And in our entire life in my family, we grew up being aware and knowing and being in the moment of everything that everybody was doing. My father, uh, in partnership with a lot of people when he was mayor, opened up City Hall um, and made sure that African-Americans uh, took their rightful place in positions of power. He took down the Confederate flag in 1967 in the city council chamber with other folks. Um, so you jump forward, when I got elected to the legislature in 88, in 1990, David Duke got elected to the legislature. And I was prescient enough to know that you had to fight everything that you had to fight about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan. And so we were in the, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is this, this area was not new to me. But during this entire period of time, uh, everybody was driving by these monuments while all of this stuff was going on. There were people who were saying, take them down, but it wasn't something that was actually registering into like, you know, being aware, like you got to do something about that. And it really, it really was not until I was the mayor of the city. I was, I don't know, I was 50, 50, 54 years old at the time, uh, where I was charged with rebuilding the city of New Orleans after having been destroyed by Katrina. Now, the mantra was to don't put the city back like it was. To take a minute and look at the city. Who left everybody on, on the roofs? Who left everybody on the steps of the Superdome? Who left everybody at the convention center? You can say, well, the governor and the mayor, they didn't evacuate them. That's, that's a, a, a narrow lens through which to analyze that. But the bigger lens is, how in the world did America end up in the situation where she ended up when a catastrophic event had such disproportionate impact on African-Americans. That's an institutional question. How did they get left there? And if it was true that the systems that were designed created a situation where that many people had the inability to move on their own out of harm's way, then we all kind of, we, we the country left them there. We left our fellow, just like in COVID right now, when you look at the disparate impact on African-Americans, you can say, well, well, COVID is an equal opportunity herder. No, it, the, way, the way that it is spread is equal, but the impact that it's having on people, where it's finding them where they are, the next question is, well, where are they? And how do they get there? And what systems are in place that made them more vulnerable than other folks? Then you start getting into the deep institutional designs of the country. So in that con context, we were building the city back, not the way it was but the way it should have been if we would have gotten it right the first time. And we were reconstructing our healthcare delivery system through primary healthcare clinics, hospitals. We rebuilt the schools. We were really thinking about equity. And in the middle, and I still hadn't thought about the monuments. I just, I was, we were rebuilding. If you were here during that period of time, the whole city was being reconstructed while we were trying to still hang on to some sense of our history, but tell the right history. So when I was doing that, the reason I checked you on Colin Wenton, an artist, when, I heard this because Wenton was my friend and I had grown up with him. And this was a discussion between two human beings. It was about humanity. And Wenton, I say he hit me in the side of the head. We were just talking one morning at Starbucks on Convention Center Boulevard. And I was asking him to help me curate the 300th anniversary of New Orleans, which was in 2018. So this is a discussion taking place in 2014. I'm thinking ahead about planning this massive event, like an Olympics and he says to me, well, you know, I hear you. He basically called me a hypocrite. He would deny it, but that's what he was saying was, but if you're going to do that, if you're doing what you're telling me to do, you're not seeing something. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? He goes, I, I want you, I'll help you. He said, but I want you to do something for me. I want you to think about, he said, I want you to think about, which is a terrible thing to ask a kid that was educated by the Jesuits. He goes, I want you to think about taking those monuments down. And I thought, I said, you lost your damn mind. He says, no, 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 I want, you to, I want you to really think about it. I said, well, why would I do that? And he said, well, why wouldn't you do it? Have you ever thought about what they are? And, and in an embarrassing moment, I thought, you know, actually I haven't. And then he said, you know, have you ever thought about it or would you think about it from my perspective? In other words, how do you feel if you were me? And he goes, do you know who put them up? And I said, no. And he said, do you know, Louis Armstrong left here because of those monuments. Now, when he said that, I don't know if you've ever had a moment, but I had given, I don't know, a ton of speeches, the best of which was only four minutes long that I gave for my first inaugural address as Lieutenant Governor. And the title of it was The New South. When I created, when I spoke about the vision for the New South, if we had ever gotten everything right, and I talked about the diaspora, 
when he, when he mentioned to me that Louis Armstrong had left, he reminded me of another talk I had given about the South losing its way by sending all of its best talent, all the intellectual capital, all of our raw material, all of everything that we had because of hate out of the South into other parts of the country where people like Wenton. So it's interesting that he said Louis Armstrong, because I was thinking when he said Louis, I was thinking about Wenton, because Wenton left New Orleans and went to New York City and created Jazz at Lincoln Center, is it that is a building that costs eight hundred million dollars, I think, to build. It's got three beautiful auditoriums in it. They employ like thousands of people, and they're pushing art into the ears of people and lifting them up. Raw material from New Orleans, edifying the rest of the world. I was jealous. I wanted that in New Orleans. But Louis Armstrong felt like he couldn't live here. And how many people, so go read Isabella Wilkins' book about the warmth of other suns. How many people from the South were forced to leave to find their hope, to find their freedom, to find their joy? So when he, when he told me that, that's why I said he hit me with a bat, because it was just like somebody just exploding my head. And that's when I knew, first of all, that I was in trouble, because I was about to get in, in a fight that I knew was going to be a big fight that was going to upset a lot of people. But I knew in, in instinctively that he was completely right. Um, and then I just had to figure out whether I could do it, whether I had the power to do it, whether I had the authority to do it, whether there was ownership, because you know, you'll see this right now, who's got the authority to take down a particular piece. It gets to be a very localized issue. In any event, when he woke me up to that, I, I spent some, some real quiet time talking to historians. I talked to Walter Isaacson. I talked to Ken Burns. I talked to, uh, um, to, I don't know, 15 or 20 people just to make sure that my head was right about this. And uh, the truth of the matter is I kept coming back to the truth, which is they should have never been put up. They were put up for the wrong reason. There's no justification for them being there. And New Orleans really can't live in her truth um, as she rebuilds her city uh, along the notion of building it back the way it should have been if you would have gotten it right the first time and leave them up. There was just no way to do it. And so irrespective of the political consequence, um, it, it just occurred to me that Wenton was just kind of right. He just straight up was right. And so, you know, when that happens, you, can, you have two choices. You can ignore it and walk away or you can do something about it. I mean, those are your two choices. And I remember I had a dream and, and it was a weird dream of me uh, talking to one of my grandchildren. And I only have one now and I didn't have any at the time, but it was a long time in the future. And it was very poignant. that my grandchild was asking me, Papa, when you were the mayor and that thing happened, what did you do? And I, I just knew how I wanted to answer the question. I mean, <laughs> You know, there were other reasons, but you know, when you really got into your, in your head on that kind of stuff and people ask you, well, when you were there, you know, what did you, what did you do? How would, how do you want to answer that question? That's usually a pretty good direction, you know, that, that you want to go in and you, and, and it's a pretty clear, but do you listen to your conscience? Do you walk away because you're afraid your friends are going to not be your friends anymore? Are they going to tease you? You know, how do you stand in your strength? And so it's ironic. And I'll, I'll end with this, that, that, you know, John Lewis passed. He was one of my, he was my hero. I loved him. He wasn't the tallest. He wasn't the fastest. He wasn't the best looking. He had a, he, he had a speech impediment, but man, he kept going, you know, and I had a picture of him on the foot of the bridge right behind you. I have a picture of him on the, every time I got scared, which was a lot, I watched him getting ready to take that whooping from that sheriff. And he stood there and took it, you know, and I, that's where I kind of he got help overcoming you know, the fear that I, I felt and so many other people felt about the backlash that was, that was going to come. So that's how that happened. Uh, that's the longer version of it. There's more, there's more there, but it wasn't a straight line. Uh, I wanted to say one thing that I know, you know, John Lewis is, you were, was a very important person to you. And I, you know, I, I know that his death must be a, a huge loss for you. I'm, I know that you, you end your acknowledgements with a, a nod to John Lewis, who taught you how to keep fighting, which is what you, yeah. He just kept going. I mean, it was incredible. If you read everything about him, the most prescient thing about him and the most incredible thing was he just kept going. You know, Doc, so many of, our, of, of our, the people who we emulate now as heroes, and we have a tendency to create myths around them. They were fully human in, in every way, um, which meant they had good things about them and bad things about them. Um, the ones who are taken from us early, 
you know, uh, or, or, or tend to be, tend to grow bigger in, in history and in myth, but very few people have to run the whole course. I mean, he pretty much ran the whole course. If you think about it, that's, that is a, that's a whole nother thing. Um, and, and he did it with grace and he did it with, with, with dignity. But to me, the most the critical thing about him was his perseverance, mm. you know, and he just kept going. So you had you, you had to do a little bit of that. Maybe you drew on John Lewis's example when you, you know, you made this decision to do something about the do the right thing is and went and put it to you and and you uh, initiated this process to have these monuments removed. But you encountered a lot of resistance. But the thing that really struck me, you begin your book here by talking about the fact that you couldn't get a crane huh. to remove yeah. these things. And, and the, the, the bigger picture you draw about that is that this was, this is a good, an example of institutionalized racism. How yes. you, go ahead. So, you know, cause you've written a lot about this and you've traveled around the South. Um, most white people, so I, my team traveled around the South in the last year and a half too. We went to 33 different counties, in 13 different states. We've been to Hazard. We've been to Dog Patch, Kentucky. We've been to Indianola. We've been to Sunflower County. We've been to Tallulah, the Delta. We've been through West Virginia. And in yickety yakking with people, um, I don't want to make, I, I'll draw some broad generalizations, but mostly white people who responded to our request to have a talk <sighs> believe that um, racism was an individual act of malice you know, a, a, of a white person against a black person um, in the context of African-American and white racism. When you started to talk to them about institutional bias and institutional racism, they, for the most part, didn't understand it, professed not to know about it, rejected the idea. If you talk to them about white privilege, their back got really up. You know, they earned everything on their own. Nobody ever helped them. They were born by themselves and they ate by themselves. They learned how to walk by themselves, you know. So anyway, you know, without teasing too much about it. Um, and, 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 and knowing the difference between those two things, it's enunciated in the law in a way that we're familiar with from Brown versus Board and other folks about de jure segregation and de facto. Um, and of course, you know now that w we could change the law uh, to dictate that human beings do certain things but you can slow walk the law. You can manipulate the implementation of the law and you can do it in ways that people don't even notice that are not race conscious, but race impacted. So I remember my daddy and Norman Francis, who as you remind you, I told you, they went to college together in law school and uh, say, the stories they used to tell me about when Brown versus Board of Education came down, they were young Southerners at the time. They thought, thank God, finally it's over. Like they, their, their, their naive minds were once the Supreme Court said that the law was going to change, that somehow magically the hearts and minds of Americans were going to change right away. And they never really could, because they couldn't see forward, um, predict what was going to happen, which was basically this, that legislators were going to get elected by districts that were gerrymandered to favor conservative white people against African Americans, or that banks were going to pass redlining you know, uh, laws that prohibited or, or didn't allow them to, to give loans to African Americans, or that there were going to be every kind of roadblock set up that was going to make it harder for African Americans to move forward and not in subtle ways. And, and by the way, the other day I was talking to one of the folks that works for me and I was asking her, um, African American woman from the South, I said, tell me, tell me a little bit about, you know, your experiences with race and, and the difference between de facto and de jure. She says, listen, that's easy. She said, uh, when I used to walk back and forth to school, um, I'd be walking down the road. It was a country road. And the white guy, the white boys it used to be in the back of the pickup truck and they'd have a Confederate flag. And they would drive by me and they would call me the N-word and they would throw cans at me. And uh, I said, how'd that make you feel? She goes, I mean, obviously it made me feel awful. And she said, but I wasn't that overly scared other than the fact that I was by myself. Um, but you know, that is a, that is a, a, a personal form of racism. I said, well, is that what scared you the most? She said, absolutely not. 
She said, the thing that scares me the most and scared me that continues to do so because I have two master's degrees is that there is a company that I want to work for. Um, and, and the person that runs that company or the institutional bias in that company is going to stop me from being able to make a living um, and support my family. And nobody will even know why institutional biases that are built into the decisions that are made that have a negative consequence. And so in the report that my team wrote that I, I would commend to you for looking that you can find at unum, U-N-U-M fund.org, um, the title wrote itself. After all of our travels, after all of our research, we concluded <laughs> what everybody should know, which is we are the way we are in this country because it was divided by design. In other words, I think that you could, you could level um, the accusation or conclusion that we actually designed the system the way that it's actually working. And that whether it was intended to work this way or that was from benign neglect, the consequence of what it is that we have created is an unlevel playing field that makes it much harder for African-Americans to do well than it is for white people. And that as a consequence, there is no benefit of the doubt for them. Um, and there is a lot of benefit of the doubt for us, which can be manifest if you went to an all boys school, which as you know, you went to school with a bunch of guys that were not the sharpest tool in the shed who are running their father's companies right now. And that there were a lot of other kids that were really the sharpest tool at the shed that never got the shot, never got the chance. Finding that balance is right and just, but it's also better for us as a country. And the idea is how we get from where we are to there, but you cannot do that unless you have a open and honest discussion about how we got where we are without just beating yourself up to death about it. I mean, just an honest discussion because we're all being left behind. I mean, hundred percent, this country is not even close to scratching the surface about our capability, but how could you expect to, if you leave half of the team, that could be help on the bench. It doesn't make any sense to me. And not only is it unjust and it's unfair uh, to the individuals who suffer not having that opportunity, but it hurts the rest of the country because we are much, we are all collectively much less than if it were the, the, the right way. So you, these conversations that you're talking about, the, you help to kind of facilitate those through the welcome table project and then now with the unum fund is in a more kind of national level you are doing a lot of this kind of traveling around and and gathering stories from people what what are you um what are you finding as you uh as you travel around and you hear from different people well, as I said before, first of all, there's nothing that I've ever spoken, nothing that I've ever written that is original. It all comes from standing on the shoulders of other people that have written and gone before me. And those truths, as, as, I, have, as I have said, transcend time and space, by the way. So if you look at South Africa's process, or you look at Germany's process of how they said they were sorry and were asking for an I forgive you and a redesign of how their systems work, we in this great country have never done that. All right. So William Winter was always a, 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 I was a great admirer of him. I happen to remember as a kid that the civil rights movement had African-Americans and whites. You know, I remember my dad's work back in the day and then William Winter's and, and there were other people. But as I got older, it turns out that all the white people got really conservative and the, and the African-Americans and it got split. And I was like, where was that great coalition that helped make that happen? You see that coalition reasserting itself now, which is a really great thing. But in the middle of that, I had followed William Winter's work and he started something called the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation. And in that institute, they had this initiative called the Welcome Table that when I became Lieutenant Governor of the state of Louisiana, I wanted to learn more about. Susan Glisson, who used to work uh, with the institute, came over, started talking to us about it. Then I, I, I kind of be, I became, I did become mayor of the city. And so that now that I was a chief executive officer, I wanted to really use that model in the city. So most people don't, will remember, most people will not remember this, but for the two years before we took the monuments down, while I was having that conversation with Wenton, we also had this thing going on where we had 600 people in the city, white and black meeting. In other words, we were planting the seeds. 
And all of those different groups met and each one of them was supposed to come up with a community project that came out of their communion together across racial lines. And my project, it turns out, was we're going to take the monuments down. But it was part of the welcome table piece. Anyway, you know the story about taking the monuments down because we did it. But after that happened, when I got out of office, I kind of had to think about, well, you know, how do I want to spend my time? And what do I really want to work on? And, you know, sometimes when you go down a rabbit hole, if you just trust and keep following it, you know, I, I, re I realized, came to realize more than I did even when I started this, how much the country needs to find a way to the other side. Um, and this is part of trying to get to the other side because in my, in my work, my limited work that I have done on race, I have noticed that it's hard for people to talk about, one. Number two, we don't know how to do it well. Uh, two, number three, we're afraid of it. And we keep trying to go around it. We keep trying to go under it. We keep trying to go over it. We keep trying to deflect. And I just think you have to go through it. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to stop talking and listen to people in the event that when I was mayor, I was so close to the center of power and so focused on getting stuff done that I missed something bigger or something more intuitive or something that I didn't understand, which is why I really spent a year listening, my entire team. So Dr. Roxanne Franklin Loria produced an instrument that, would, that was created by people who know how to help talk to folks. And we actually, I think we talked to over a, a, a thousand people. And some of it was individual interviews that lasted a half hour. 45 minutes. Some of them were focus groups. Some of them were kind of community meetings that didn't have fancy people at them, meaning the mayors or the governors or all this stuff. They were just quiet community meetings to listen to people's language and to see if we could really find out where the common ground was, um, if there was any. Um, and it turns out that there's a lot. It also turns out that there's a lot of situations where people who live in the same communities live um, a block away from each other and a world apart. One zip code, everybody goes to college and does great. Another zip code, everybody's gone to Parchment or they've gone to Angola. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see the divides, you know, if you're in a school district or, or, or wherever you are. I had one gentleman in, a, mm -hmm. we were in North Louisiana. I think we were in Tallulah. Uh, it was an older African-American gentleman. I asked him if there was any racism in his community. And he said, no. And I said, really? I said, well, you know, <laughs> where, where, do, where do you live? And he says, across the tracks. Uh, now, anybody who knows anything knows there's always an across the tracks, or there's always an across the lake, or there's always across the interstate. And I said, well, where the white people live? He said, on the other side of the tracks. I said, yeah. I said, I asked you if there was any racism. He, he said, son, he said, uh, you don't understand. And I said, well, uh, well what don't I understand? He goes, he goes, we have reached a, pe a place of peaceful segregation in this community. And I was like, really? That's the first time I had ever heard that term, that term, peaceful segregation, which I thought was just really, really telling about the fact that people have given up on finding full communion. And we don't yet really appreciate in this country the great uh, opportunity that we have when we come together and when we're with each other and what that really, really looks like. That's why Wenton was such a, a prescient uh, person to tell me this because his expertise is, he's really a historian, music is his medium, and his choice of music is freedom music, which is, which is jazz. And jazz is the best example of democracy and the constitution than any other form of music that exists in the world. The way it's played, how it's confected, how people, have their individuality, but yes, they come back together, how the sounds are discordant, but they're harmonious, you know, how they start off together and then break out individually, then come back at the end in common purpose. It, it is the music of freedom. And, and he talks a lot about that. And so it was really kind of weird that he was, well, maybe it was ordained that, that that's the reason why he hit me on the head hmm. because he was telling me you're in new Orleans and it's all about jazz and you need to start playing the music or go away. <laughs> I guess. I mean, that's kind of what was in my head when, when, you know, we were dancing through all that stuff. I know, um, just keeping one eye on the clock here, 50, 
something minutes gone by extremely fast. Sorry. Oh uh, no, no, it's that's uh, incredibly rich. I, I'm sure other people may have some things they want to ask you. So if you um, if you have something you'd like to ask Mitch about, just unmute yourself and jump in. We'll do it that way. While um, while people are maybe framing their questions i the when your last remarks you you used a couple of turns of phrase that um i'm curious to hear you talk about you talk about full communion about uh, your political uh and cultural aims leading towards a full communion of americans which there's a theological kind of resonance to that and you you know, you went to you went to Catholic U, Jesuit high school, Loyola. I know there have been a number of um, priests that have been formative in your in your journey. How much of that tradition still guides you? You talk about this at the end of the book about the Jesuit formation you have of being uh, people for others. Well, I don't want to give the misimpression. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a terribly good Catholic or a terribly good Christian. I make lots of mistakes. I've made more in my life than I would ever want to admit to anybody. But, um, you know, things you learn early on about how you're supposed to be, if you're an honest person, or you, are you trying to figure out how to get better? You have to ask yourself, well, where did I go wrong in my life, and how can I get better? And is this kind of a good rule that we should try to follow, even if you don't get there every day? So to me, without getting too, without getting too ethereal with you guys, I, I taught a civics class last year, and, and it seems to me that um, the greatest commandment, right? You should love your larger God with all your heart and all your soul and love your neighbor as yourself. And then what comes after that, well, like, who is your neighbor? And then the stories of the Good Samaritan, et cetera, et cetera, and the Beatitudes. That's not only a good way to try to live, it's actually a pretty good governing philosophy. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by that creator with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You can hear, the, you can hear those theological strains in that. Now, it also occurs to me that most of the people who I know that profess to be Catholic and Christian, uh, not all of them, honestly, but... But, but certainly some of them, you know, hear that stuff in mass on Sunday and we don't, we don't live it very well. <laughs> we don't, so, you know, you know, like when you, when you kind of point out to people, but you know, these people are dying and they need healthcare. They're like, Oh, well, what's that got to do with me? Well, it, it, I think it has something to do with it. And so as you, you know, all you listen to that stuff um, ab about what you're supposed to do and you ask yourself, am I doing that? And how integrate, how, how, Am I living, are we, are we, am I, are we living a life of integrity? Are we the country that we say we are? Are we really trying to form a more perfect union? Are all people created equal? I don't know. Tell me again how you for keeping those monuments up. If you think that we're all created equal, I don't understand. Explain that to me. So that stuff's in your head all the time. So it's really more of um, a period of questioning than it is of finding the answers and then asking yourself, are we really doing what, are we who we say we are? If we are trying to save the soul of the nation, really like, what, what, what are we? Who do we profess to be? How close are we to that? Are we really the greatest country that ever was? Can you be great without being good? If you leave so many people behind and people don't have the sustenance of food and healthcare and education, you know, do they really have the same opportunity um, do, to pursue happiness, quote unquote, which by the way, was a punt on the word property. <laughs> it used to be property. They made a pursuit of happiness. Why did they really do that? Um, Thomas Jefferson was the guy that wrote this, but he was having, he had a, tell me about Sally Hemings. All men are created equal, but you have slaves. That's not a condemnation, but it, Hey, tell me about what that, what that looks like. And if America ever really found the courage to be who she says she is, wouldn't we all be better off? And can we quantify that? I think you can actually. And I think this is what a lot of white people miss because I think they're scared to death. I think white people are really afraid right now because they don't know a lot of people of color and they have a, 
uh, a misdirected fear that people of color are going to be the way they were. And I'm here to tell you that they're not. That has never been my experience. So I tell white people, don't be afraid. They're not going to treat us the way we treated them. Just put that out of your mind. Um, and by the way, you ought to start acting with justice in the event that you think they might. You might want to just know that in 2040, the country is going to be majority minority. So even if you're not doing it out of justice, you might want to think about it as a matter of self-interest, how we're all going to come into that full communion that we talk about. You know, or maybe you will get left behind, or maybe you're afraid of just competing on a level playing field. I just think that justice trickles up. It doesn't trickle down and people don't have to be left out of it. It is the one place where just like economic growth, it's like just as growth. It goes broader and bigger and produces more and it's not a zero sum game. And I don't think America has come even close to stretching its legs out on this issue. And in fact, it would put ourselves way behind and have made us weaker uh, economically from a national security perspective and certainly internally. Um, so that's why I'm so hopeful about the future, because I know, I, I absolutely believe that I know, you know, things that you think, things that you know, that we're better together. There's no, I mean, I've, that, I've settled that in my mind. Um, not that, it, you know, everybody's got to make this decision themselves, but I am betting on that like a thousand percent, because that's what I have learned. That's what I know. That's what I understand. That's what I've been taught. But much more importantly, that is what I have personally experienced in my life, that my life has become so much more enriched by the people who are very different from me and quote unquote overtly in every way. Um, and I'm the better for it. And I am much, much worse off when I just hang out with people that just look like me mm -hmm. and only have the experience in life that I had. I'm much lesser because of it. And so that's where I'm going to choose to spend my time um, that, that I have left. <sighs> kind of hard to follow that with the other. You can. <laughs> I'll, stay, I'll stay a minute. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, Lucille, I'll, she's hey, Lucille. got her hand up. I'll, uh, you might need to unmute yourself, Lucille. I... There you go. Okay. There you go. Hey, Lucille. Um, nice. I would love, this seems like such a rich place to, have um, the diversity that that Mitch is talking about right here in this Zoom call for the next three years. I don't know how you go about inviting people to come and join it, but I noticed that we don't have a 50-50 ratio here of, of diversity. Mm -hmm. We have men and women, but we don't have um, we don't have American Indians. We don't have African Americans. Um, anyway, just a suggestion. I, I, it would be so rich. It was. It, it, I would love it if we could do that. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Well, it raises, it raises a, a very challenging issue for everybody. You know, when people say, first of all, um, with E Pluribus Unum, we're actually doing this as we, we're trying to. Every Thursday, we have a series that's called Truth, Action, Reconciliation. So we had the first four weeks will be truth, where we're talking about the truth of our history. And we're having very, you know, very esteemed speakers talk to us and you're welcome to join those calls. Um, but you know, one of the questions people always ask is like, well, you know, I'm, don't sell me anymore. I'm a white guy. I really want to try to figure this out. What should I do? <laughs> First of all, your African-American friends are going to say, quit, quit asking me what you're supposed to do. We, we, we got enough to do without telling you white people how to figure this out. Okay. So that's, I'm, I'm speaking colloquially, obviously, but that sentiment is, it's not our burden to, for white people, number one. Number two, given the internet and access to every piece of information, the first thing that white people should do is try to educate themselves about what our real history is. Now, if you're looking for a guide, there are thousands of different guides to books and thoughts. But really, if you're just a curious person and you go on the internet and you keep Googling links and going down the, going down the pathway like you're you know, trying to find your way back home, 
you should really just make yourself think about this. The third, the, the other thing too, which you, you would, the question that we have to ask is, is as we're so mad at President Trump for being so overtly racist and misusing his power to just destroy the country and the world, which I think is the correct view. You may feel differently, but that's kind of where I am. Um, and you're mad at Mitch McConnell or you're mad at Congress for not doing what they're doing or your governor or your mayor, you know, eventually you're gonna to get to, well, what am I doing in my neighborhood? What am I doing in my home? Where are my kids going to school? Who are we friends with? Who am I trying to reach out to? Who am I leaving out? What have I done in my life before you get to everybody else? So you kind of build it from the bottom up as well as demand it come from the top down. So the question that you ask, um, Lucy, is a good one. And, and it's okay to recognize that you look at who's on this call and say, this is mostly white people. And we're having a conversation with race about race. Why, why are we that way? And can we make it better? And by the way, who else should be included? Is it just African-Americans and whites, Vietnamese? Is it Native Americans? What, what is it? What's that conversation? Which is to say this, I really don't know the answer to any of these things, but I have more questions that require answers. And I, I can assert this to you, that we don't really know how to do this because we're not practiced in it. But it's a great step to say, we want to be practiced in it and we want to get better. And I want to learn more and I am open. And so I've, I've used this phrase and I, I happen to be particularly bad at this, but I believe it to be true. That the most significant six words in the English language, are, I am sorry and I forgive you. I'm bad at both of those things. I'm bad at saying I'm sorry and I'm bad at saying I forgive you. But I am sure that it is the pathway towards reconciliation. Does that make any sense? So we have to ask ourselves, well, what does I'm sorry look like? What does I forgive you look like? What's the distance between those two things? You know, you, you have kids, right? You have, you, have, you have, I have five kids. My mother had nine. She used to make us kneel on the ground and put our heads against each other so that, that our future depended on each other. And within a reasonably short period of time, we were laughing and giggling and we had forgotten what we were upset about. And I say that as a cute way, not as an analogy to where we are, but think about the African-American community saying, uh, and I think this is, I can say this, based on my travels too, even though there were disagreements between and amongst even African-Americans that responded to our call to be interviewed, that when we talked about reparations, which set white people's hair on fire, just like, oh my God, why did you say that word? <laughs> and a white privilege, which have set them, not universally, but generally. But for African-Americans, although they were very different, the one thing that was universally true is they wanted white people to at least acknowledge I mean, like I'll, I, the least that I can expect of you is for you to at least acknowledge our history. Can you just do that for me? I mean, that's a low bar for white people, right? And, 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 and in some instances, no, they can't, which is like, how do you, get, how do you ask the African-American community for reconciliation if we as a group cannot acknowledge what happened? Or if someone apologizes, some official apologizes for slavery, did they get punched in the head? What do you, if you're an African-American and you're looking at that, you go, well, like what, like what, what am I supposed to do now about that? And so I think the country has got to really go through this and whether it looks like truth and reconciliation commissions on the federal level and on the state level and on the local level and on the neighborhood level in a process that actually um, communicates to the African-American community or the native American community, we really do want to get back to being honest about who we were and how we got here. Why would they trust? that there's gonna be uh, an, an, uh, an equal pathway forward. They wouldn't, and we shouldn't expect them to. So we, they would say to us, quit, quit asking me, quit asking us, you go figure it out. And actually an African-American writer the other day who was on one of the podcasts said something that I actually happen to agree with. He said, you know, I'm so sick of listening to white people talk about what's wrong with the black people. You know, why, why this, why that, why are you this way? He goes, how come white people don't ask what's wrong with them? I mean, that's a pretty, I mean, has anybody ever asked you what's wrong with you? Has actually, let me ask you this. Has anybody actually reminded you how white you are on a daily basis so that you have to carry your whiteness with you? Talk to most African-Americans, doesn't matter whether they're rich or whether they're poor, or whether they, you know, are the head of the company or smaller. They will speak to you about being forced to wear their blackness, being aware, being self-conscious all the time. You know what kind of lack of freedom attends to having to be self-conscious every day? that you're gonna be judged just because 
of the way you look. White people have a hard time even feeling that thing. And I think African Americans are just asking us just basic stuff. That's why the George Floyd piece laid on top of a long history, laid on top of Katrina, laid on top of everything back to Emmett Till, laid on top of the slavery, where finally you cannot turn away from that. You cannot deny, you can't deny it. But why does it take that? This is the next question that we really got to think about. Why does it take that? And Amon Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, right? And Ferguson and Freddie Gray and Louima in 1996. I mean, like at what point in time are the allies going to show up and say, you know what? Come on. And I think that's where the country is. And shame on us, shame on us if we let this moment go by and not actually hold ourselves accountable to do something different. Well, I have, oh, Matt. How about one more? In, okay. You've given us more time than. I know. Than, let's, do, um, let's just do one more. And we'll, you probably we'll have to spare. <laughs> and I'm, I, um, I put some links in the, the chat there so you can follow Mitch on Twitter. And uh, you can check out the Unum Fund. So can they, can we, uh, find those calls you were talking about through the Unum Fund website? Yes, if you go to unumfund.org, um, you will see links to uh, Divided by Design is the name of the report that was issued in October that I commend to you. It actually has links to videos of individuals that we talk to so you can hear that, see their faces and hear their stories. There's also a policy document that we put together that we released in February that talks about, that answers the question, okay, hot shot, if we were designed the wrong way and we wanted to design it the right way, what would y'all do? So it's got directives, it's got suggestions, I'm sorry, to the federal, state, and local officials about ways they might want to think of redesigning the institutions of government and healthcare and all that stuff. And then finally, it's got the link to the conversations that we are having every Thursday. I think it's at one o'clock, it might be at two. And that'll go on from now until August 6th. And hopefully, like these conversations that I find to be very edifying and fruitful, We'll continue to do that. And we want to try to find partners. So, you know, you guys keep thinking about what you're doing. I mean, I'm thrilled that, that you're interested enough to participate in these kind of conversations and you're willing to have them with friends who might not like you after you have them, you know, but that's just kind of the way it goes. You yeah. know what I mean? Thanks. Before I, I let you go, can I ask one thing of you? Sure. Can you give us a little Jesus Christ superstar? No. <laughs> Oh, my singing career is over, but it was, it was fantastic. Let me just say. I'm sure it was glorious. Well, let me just say this. Everything was great about it except the crucifixion. That was not, that was not good. Maybe some other time we can talk, talk about, uh, about what that was like. It was um, great. It was fantastic. In the meantime, I hope there is another conversation sometime soon, whether sure, it's here or in New Orleans. And I'm so grateful for your time today and for your work and for all of you who are here. And I uh, hope we can do this again soon. Well, listen, I'll, let me just end with this. If you guys are from the South, you got a lot to do. We have a lot to do together. Um, and it's really, really, really important because I believe that resurrection and redemption come from the most unlikely of places. And I think the South, because of the pain that we've gone through and the pain that we've caused, actually has the answer for the rest of the country. And I, I just think it makes historical sense for us to be the ones that lead the way. Um, and as a white Southerner, you know, which is why I, why I wrote the title of the book that way, that I think we have a special responsibility to get it done. I know you share that too. So I thank you for letting me be in your presence and, uh, and I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation today.